Good to know you're still with us. With the increase in banditry and killings, Nigerian military says they lack manpower and funding. The Minister of Defense, Bashir Makashi, says the Nigerian military is understaffed and underfunded to tackle the various security challenges facing the country. The minister briefed journalists after Wednesday's Federal Executive Council meeting, saying he made a presentation at the meeting on the security challenges facing Nigeria. So all the past funding for the military went where? To help us make sense of this, we're joined by Dr. Kabir Adamu, Security Risk Management Specialist and Managing Director, Beacon Consulting Limited. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Felicita. Good evening. A security analyst, Peter Egbedio, joins us as well for this conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you as well. Good evening. All right, let's get started. I will come to you first, Dr. Kabir. We know that the defense sector has, for the past five years, taken a large chunk of Nigeria's budget, larger than education and health, for instance. In the current 2020 budget, which is about to be amended, we know that they have 8%. That's um, eight, over 800 billion naira of the 10 um, trillion naira um, was allocated to defense. Does this poke holes in the minister's claim that the military is understaffed and underfunded? Um, yes, uh, based on my study of um, the Nigerian defense policy and, of course, the operations of the military, uh, well, I would say since um, this, uh, the administration before that, that of um, Obasanjo, and then, of course, into um, that of Goodluck Jonathan, now uh, President Buhari, the military has been taxed with responsibilities that, frankly, are outside its core mandate. The reality is that Nigeria is in a war situation at the moment. So there is no amount of funding, including the budgetary funding that um, you've mentioned, the extra budgetary uh, allocations that we know severally the, gov the government has been um, has approached the National Assembly to make that would be enough for the military. If we're looking at um, numbers as an example, um, the figure for the entire military is at about maybe 120 to 130,000. Um, out of that, the soldiers that are able to go out in the field and carry out this operation, uh, let's say about maybe 70,000 to 80,000. Now, the last, at the last count, there are roughly around 36 um, operations, sorry, operations in 36 states across the country. Some of these operations are short-term operations. Some... Dr. Kabir, can um, you hear me? An example. Okay, let's bring in uh, Peter while we try and see what happens with the network. Uh, Peter, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, good evening. Okay, good. Uh, several officials, including Army Chief Tukumburatai, have repeatedly complained that money is not often released for items and projects approved in the budget on time. Might this be a more acceptable complaint, maybe? Well, um, he's not, he's not um, far from the truth. Generally, the um, kind of government that we run, we are going to be, be um, red tape. Bureaucracy affects a lot of the operations of, um, of, of the military, which is why, for instance, the asymmetrical warfare that the insurgents are engaged in, they, are, they don't have the kind of funding restraints or constraints that our military might have in terms of how the money is disbursed, how they are able to access funding, uh, and, and access, access web primary as well too. So I, I don't think he's far from the truth to saying that the bureaucracy sometimes um, slows down the operations of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a military, especially in wartime like we are. Although officially Nigeria is not at war because it's a civil um, uprising in the, in the sense, um, he's not far from the truth. I agree with him. All right, let's, let's go back to Dr. Kabir and see if he can, uh, we, he can complete his thought on that. Dr. Kabir, can you complete your thought on the first question as regards the underfunding? Uh, thank, thank you. I, I was trying to make the point that the number of operations that the military is involved in, which are internal operations, have put a burden on its um, budgetary allocations, and that that means no matter the amount of money given to the military, it would not be enough to sustain the operations. Um, the equipment the military is using are very expensive. 
the um, overhead cost in terms of logistics, in terms of the welfare, in terms of salary of its officers, is also another budget, uh, budgetary subhead. So yes, I, um, I am I'm in tune with the Minister of Defense when he says that they are short of equipment and of, of also that the funding is not enough. And that is not uh, because um, the military is doing the right thing. My position is that the military is, has taken up responsibility that should not be its responsibility. So it's um, when, when, when uh, you crime. talk about taking up responsibility that is not their responsibility, are you making reference to the fact that they do the job of the police sometimes? Yes, all the internal operations um, that the military has been asked to be involved in. And I must be clear, it is not that the military uh, went to ask for this. It is the political class that decided to involve the military. Now, the argument is that the police is not able to handle those uh, issues. That is why the military are brought in. But our constitution is very clear. Our constitution says when we reach such a situation, the National Assembly needs to be involved, and then there needs to be a parliamentary approval for the involvement of the military. Yes, the president has the discretion to invite the military to be involved, but there needs to be um, a parliamentary approval. So what we have seen in the past is that because of our, our military past, um, unfortunately, the parliament has not been um, able to exercise that rule uh, the way it should be exercised. I mentioned earlier on that there are operations such as Operation Safe Haven that has been ongoing for more than a decade. Safe Haven is in Plateau State and Southern Kaduna. Um, I'm almost certain that at inception, when it was planned, it was meant to be for a short period, a stopgap um, arrangement to tackle the immediate security challenges. And then, of course, the uh, military structures and the other security infrastructure will take up uh, the, 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 the situation. But we now have a situation where Operation Safe Haven is almost 12 years old or even longer than that. And so those things were not planned for in the budgetary allocation. Those are things that will have to be planned for as an extra, GD, extra budgetary provision. And that is why the military has found itself in the situation where it is. Um, right. There is no part of the country at the moment that you will pick that the military is not involved in one operation, uh, internal right. operation let, let, or the let's, other. Let's, let's bring um, uh, Mr. Peter in. Um, I want to jump off the comments that the, the doctor um, made about the fact that um, the minister does have a point when he talked about the equipment and staffing. Um, what would be your reaction to comments about a lack of maximization of the security budget that is available? Uh, it, would be un it would be unfair to say the budget is not being maximized when you're not privy to the, to the operations or the day-to-day -day operations in which the military is involved. Like um, Doc has, has mentioned, um, we, are, we are stretched in all, all our 36 states. Ideally, uh, even the UN posits that policing, the ratio of um, poli one police, policeman to, to the population should be one policeman to 450 people, ideally. But we are far, 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 far gone beyond that point. We are, we are on the police and now our military has been stretched. Now, um, I'll give an example. Just an AK-47 is quite expensive. The, the bullets used are expensive. The armored personnel carriers are expensive. And sometimes in the, in the, in the, in the, in the engagement with, with the insurgents, we find that sometimes they lose some of these vehicles. They lose the armored personnel carriers. Um, they lose even choppers as well. And those things cost a lot of money to, um, to, to procure. And the process for procuring them is not just for the assembly to provide the money. Sometimes even the markets to, to go to, if you remember, if you remember when Governor um, Kenyatta was president of this country, there was, a, there was a situation where we had the money to purchase arms, but we were not able to purchase the arms because of the several um, loop of blockades that were in the way for us to procure those arms legitimately. Uh, so sometimes the, the, the effects of the engagement itself, the wear and tear on the equipment, will, will, we can also lead to a position where the, the, the troops are generally um, they are over, they are over, they are, they are overstretched. There's something called battle fatigue as well, too. So in terms of numbers, a lot of them are deployed in different areas. And the more they are deployed like that, we find that sometimes their, their temperament is not as, as professional as, as it should be. Sometimes they lose their, they lose their cool. And you see, find some, some of them become trigger happy. So my concern and my, my agreement, again, is to say that I do believe that the situation our military has found itself in is not the most ideal one. And um, we, we ought to be a little bit more, more considerate of their plight. We see, we see videos of, of soldiers deserting, complaining that the, 
Emily has superior fire, fire uh, ammunition or firepower. Sometimes it's not a lie. Um, a lot of these insurgents in the West African province have come from, from Syria. They've come from um, world, uh, the ISIS operations there that have collapsed now because of the, the victory of the U.S. and allied forces in those places. So you find a lot of those weapons have come down to this part of the country uh, or this part of Africa. And our military is constrained in many ways. Thank you. All right. Let, let, let me, I'll, I'll, this last question, I'll, I'll split, I'll go between the two of you. So please, if you could just do uh, one minute, one minute, it uh, to be appreciated. How are we assessing the work that the military does for this country, really? Because there are those who argue that doesn't, seem to be much observed influence if you look at the level of crimes across the country. What do you say? Um, you cannot uh, use military force or police force to tackle um, issues that have roots in social, uh, you know, grievance such as poverty, um, you know, marginalization, uh, true and of course um, perceived marginalization and several other issues like climate change. So I think the basis for using the military and the police um, is wrong in the first place. We should tackle the root causes of the, co the cause of insecurity as against using the military or police to quell them. All right, uh, Peter, please. Um, I, I, do, I do believe that under the circumstances, uh, the military is, is doing the best that they can do. Um, we, are, we are in a very precarious situation and they are literally the last bastion of, of defense for us. Um, lives are lost, equipment has been, um, I mean, a lot of, they are doing a lot for the safety and security of the country. And despite the constraints that they face, Nigeria is still one. It, it would have been worse if they were not putting up the resistance that they're doing. And I, I think they are, they are, the efforts are laudable, commendable. And what the minister has said in addition to all, all what we heard before is true. Give him our support. I'm very sure we'll visit this conversation again in no distant time. But for now, thank you so much, gentlemen, for your thoughts and your time. Thank you for having us. Have a nice you. Day. Have a lovely night. And that's all we can take on the conversation tonight. We'll go on a short break and we'll come back. I will give my take to stay with us. We must go beyond the condemnation and posturing on the issue of rape and abuse of young impressionable girls. I use the word impressionable deliberately because the ripple effect of this heinous act is too far reaching to even begin to comprehend even as we agitate. It is imperative that efforts are not relaxed, that the media pressure must not go to sleep when other issues arise. Advocacy and enlightenment must continue if there is to be an increase in the rate of prosecution and conviction of sexual offenders. The National Assembly must revisit our laws. Our government must have the will to follow through with prosecution. And collectively, as a society, we must work towards providing the enabling environment for survivors to feel safe enough to speak their truth and report this crime without fear of being blamed by a hypocritical society or close family members. And that is my take. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention while the program lasted. It returns same time tomorrow. Bye for now.